Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live with James Jacob Prash, uh, live via Holland, actually. Um, Jacob, uh, the current Pope, Pope Francis, is now backing off on pedophilia charges. Uh, what is your commentary on that? His backing down the crackdown of pedophile clergy is not surprising, but let's remember, the Vatican crackdown was really window dressing anyway. What we had was an international conspiracy orchestrated by the Vatican to protect pedophiles as the Quanticuria document proves. Quanticuria was first issued by John the 23rd and then reissued under Pope John Paul II by Pope Benedict, then Cardinal Ratzinger. And it basically said, and it was not talking about confessional secrecy, it was talking about protecting the reputation of the Roman Church and its clergy from dealing with these issues that, that, that were happening. In order to protect a corrupt religious institution and its corrupt pedophile sex criminal clergy, you do that at the expense of the children. They were caught in the Republic of Ireland with a document the doctrine of mental reservation where it basically said you were allowed to lie that is to mislead the police or prosecutors in an investigation in order to protect the pedophile clergy and the church you're allowed to lie to protect the pedophile sex criminal at the expense of not protecting the little children providing the sex criminal is a priest or a nun this is a fact. This is what happened. This is what Roman Catholicism is. So the idea of a crackdown is mythical anyway. It's window dressing. It's public relations to try to turn down the lawsuits. In Boston, 1,500 plus priests with Cardinal Law, then they give him a promotion to be the chief archpriest at St. Mary's Cathedral in Rome, a Vatican position. They gave him a promotion to get him out of the country. Uh, Cardinal Mahoney, they spent nearly a billion dollars in Los Angeles alone on out-of-court settlements, plus law fees. And then they gave him a house in LA and they sent him as a member of the conclave to elect the next pope. This is a man who did this. Remember, 170 plus Roman Catholic diocese and archdiocese in the United States, 173, I believe, 171 have been found liable of protecting pedophile clergy at the expense of not protecting the children. And the other two, which is out in the middle of nowhere, like Fairbanks, Alaska or something, litigation is, is pending, I believe. But 171 out of 173, that was several years ago. This is an organized conspiracy. When the present Pope, Francis, as he calls himself, was the Cardinal and Archbishop in Buenos Aires, Argentina, he refused to meet with the families of the children who were victimized. Now the same Pope went on to say the following, if two men are in a same-sex relationship who are committed to each other, who am I to judge? Wait a minute. God has already judged. Read Romans chapter 1, what the New Testament teaches about homosexuality, on top of what the Torah teaches about homosexuality. Who am I to judge? So the liberal progressivists and homosexuals and homosexual clergy in the Roman Church will say, Oh, the Pope has changed the position of the Roman Catholic Church, now it's okay. What? First of all, the Pope has no authority to change the Word of God. But he calls himself Father and the Vicar of Christ and usurps an authority that belongs to God alone. Remember, the papacy is an antichrist institution. Call no man your father. One is your father in heaven as a religious title but they call him the Holy Father. 
the vicar of Christ is the Holy Spirit. No, they claim it's him based on bogus misinterpretations of the New Testament and historical traditions. It's all corrupt and phony. Well, the progressivists will say, oh, the Pope, Pat Francis has changed it, now it's okay. Wait a minute, if something was a sin, it was always a sin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, a moral sin now. We're not talking about covenantal observances, we're talking about moral sin. If something was a moral sin in the Old Testament, it's a moral sin in the New Testament. Jesus said it's better to have a millstone tied around your neck and be cast into the sea than to hurt a child. Well, homosexuality, read Romans chapter 1. Read what the book of Revelation says is going to happen. All of the effeminate, the homosexuals. Remember, you had widespread homosexuality and bisexuality in the Greco-Roman Empire in the time of the early church. Uh, who does he think he is? But at the same time, the conservatives in the Roman Catholic Church, the so-called traditionalists, who are no less hypocritical and phony, will say, oh, the Pope just changed the emphasis, not the substance. He hasn't changed the official doctrine, just the emphasis. He's talking out of both sides of his mouth like any other phony politician. And the so-called traditionalists in the Roman Catholic Church are making excuses for it. The reason their God is not God, their God is the Roman Church. They worship the institution, the Holy Mother of the Church. They deify the institution, the Vatican, the papacy. It's not really about Jesus. It's not about Mary. It's not about God. It's certainly not about the Word of God. Their God they worship Roman Catholicism, not God, if you really understand the way false religion works. Now let's look at this Pope. <coughs> <coughs> One Roman Catholic official admitted, if they had a zero tolerance policy towards sexual immorality, they would have a more serious shortage of priests and nuns than they have now. <laughs> and it's already very, very serious. It's the third world where they're getting their priests because you're taking people out of tribal poverty in African places like this, giving them a livelihood and an education. But the amount of sexual immorality in French-speaking Africa and the Catholic countries of Africa where they're getting these priests, the former French colonies of Africa, that the Côte d'Ivoire in these countries, these priests, they're rampantly immoral sexually. In the developed world, however, it's not just immorality, it's pedophilia. 80% of these priests who were caught molesting children, 80% approximately, were molesting little boys. They're homosexual. They caught one seminarian on his way to Mexico because... His thing was raping newborn babies, dressed up for their baptism. In the Republic of Ireland, there was one priest who raped at least 10 little girls for their first communion. If you don't just know about Catholicism, they get dressed up like brides in white, and he would take them on a honeymoon. He literally laid them down on the altar and raped 10 that they can prove. An investigation took place by the guard of the Irish police. The senior detective conducting the investigation was contacted through an organization called the Knights of Columbus in Ireland, according to the newspaper reports. He made the evidence disappear. He got rid of the envelope with the documented evidence so the priest would get off. And then the senior detective received a papal honor, a medal or an award of some kind from Pope John Paul II, who they canonized a saint. This is unbelievable corruption. The Roman Catholic Church in Italy has long been associated with the mafia in southern Italy and in Sicily, long. 
The Roman Catholic Church is a criminal enterprise like any other. We had the Ambrosioni bank scandal. Over 200 people murdered. The Calvi affair in London. The Vatican paying hundreds of millions of dollars to buy their way out of this bank fraud. Money laundering in the Vatican Bank, which they call the Ministry of Religious Works. That's what they call the bank, the Bank of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Banco Spiritus Santi. You see this in Italy, the Catholic Bank of Venuto. It's all a business, banking being a pillar of it, and corrupt banking being at the center of it. This really happened. Paul Marcinkus, an American who had been the president of the Vatican Bank, a bishop, was hid in the Vatican from the police authorities. John Paul II refused to give him over. Well, this is what the Vatican is. It's a criminal enterprise. The only thing is, the Italian mafia would not engage in child prostitution or child pornography or pedophilia. If a member of the mob did that, they'd get whacked. It takes a Roman Catholic priest to go that low. The Italian Mafia wouldn't go that low. Only the Roman Catholic Church would do something that low and disgusting. They're a criminal enterprise like any other, only more corrupt, more morally debased. I think a former Governor Keating, a Roman Catholic himself, who had been an FBI agent and a federal prosecutor. He was on the Civilian Investigation Committee who of the Roman Catholic Church itself to investigate the pedophilia. He said the Roman Catholic Church is more secretive in certain aspects than criminal organizations he investigated as an FBI agent than as a U.S. attorney and federal prosecutor. He was Catholic. And he was right. Uh, then he was fired for saying it by Cardinal Mahoney of Los Angeles. The same Mahoney who protected the pedophiles, and they spent hundreds of millions to, in effect, keep him out of prison, many would say. You couldn't make this up. Now, understand the Vatican was the same thing. It always was like this. How did Adolf Eichmann escape to Argentina? How did these Nazi war criminals make it to the Peronistas, the fascist countries, who were ideologically aligned with Hitler, Mussolini, and Franco in South America, in Brazil, and in, in particularly Argentina. How'd they get there? Through the rat line, organized during the papacy of Pius XII, a series of convents and monasteries where they were hid from the Allied authorities and smuggled into South America. That's how Eichmann and these other Nazi war criminals escaped. The Vatican protected them. They had murdered children. Eichmann murdered children. And the Roman Catholic Church protected it. They caught the last one hiding in a monastery in, in France in the 1980s. They couldn't get him out. But he was a wanted Nazi war criminal. In the 1980s they were doing it. Well, the same institution that protected Nazi war criminals who murdered children is the same institution protecting pedophile clergy who molest children and destroy their lives. This is Catholicism. It's, it's true legacy. It's what the Roman Church really is. I'm not saying everybody in it is bad. I'm not saying there are not sincere people in it, but the institution itself is fundamentally corrupt, morally bankrupt, because it is spiritually abject, and it is not scriptural Christianity. That is why they put the New Testament on the index of banned books for centuries. I always refer to the autobiography of Cardinal Manning from London. His parents were from Ireland, and he wrote in his autobiography, in my more than 40 years as a Roman Catholic priest, I've known many reasons why people would convert to Roman Catholicism, but I've only ever known one reason and one reason only why someone would renounce the Roman Catholic Church and become what he called an evangelical or conservative Protestant, in other words, a born-again believer. He said they read the Bible and had more questions than no priest could ever answer. At least he admitted it. That's quite a thing. Its corruption is staggering. Its theological corruption is staggering. Its moral, moral depravity. 
what it did with the Nazi war criminals and what it's doing with the children is beyond description. It took the Roman Catholic Church 500 years to apologize for the Spanish Inquisition. But when they did, the church did not take responsibility and they named no names. They just said, some of the sons of the church. <laughs> Notice the church itself never assumes responsibility. Those were just bad individuals, but it doesn't even name them. Because some of those bad individuals were popes. Unspeakable hypocrisy. The constitutional motto of Roman Catholicism is sempre eden, always the same. And it is always the same. Morally and ethically debased. Now let's continue looking at this issue of homosexuality. They wouldn't have enough priests if they cracked down. The Snipes Report admitted <clears throat> that 40% of Roman Catholic priests at any given time are sexually active by their own admission, and that's just the ones who admit it. I've spoken to priests and nuns who've been saved. They have told me about the alcoholism and the sexual perversion that goes on in the Roman church and system. The testimonies of many are on the internet. Now let's understand this. You look at these priests, remember, before the present time, homosexuality was not socially accepted. So what homosexuals did was go into the Roman Catholic clergy. They got to put on a cassock, they got to put on vestments. It was a socially acceptable form of cross-dressing. No women, no wives, they went to an all-male environment in a monastery or something. I remember that when I was a kid, I was in New Orleans, and I was down there on a drug deal before I was saved, of course. And my friend had a friend who was a homosexual, and he had two friends who were Franciscans. And they were both queer with $3 bills. They were smoking reefer and everything on the expense of the religious order. It was unbelievable. This is widespread. All male environment, acceptable cross-dressing. That's where homosexuals went in countries like Spain and Ireland and Poland and Brazil. That's where you went. Nuns were the same. An all-female environment. Lesbians would get their heads shaved to look like men. They had tonsorial rights, but these nuns would shave their heads look like men. And the ones who were the butch dykes, the masculinized lesbians, they would take names like Sister Michael Patrick. They'd take a man's name. And the ones who were the girly dykes, who were the feminine dykes, who wanted a female lover who resembled a male, or they put in some kind of a male pseudo-image, they would take names like Sister Elizabeth Mary or something like that. They'd take the girly names, and, and the dyke, the butch ones would take the male names. And if they swung both ways, they, they'd get a name like Sister Bridget Joseph or something like that. That's where you went. Now, a major reason so-called religious vocations are declining in Catholic countries is homosexuals and lesbians have come out of the closet. It's become an openly acceptable form of sexual expression, even though the Word of God says it's wrong. So there's less reason for these people to become priests and nuns, hence there are fewer priests and nuns. I'm not saying that's the only reason there's been a decline in the number of priests and nuns, but it is a main reason. Obviously the church has been morally decredited, and obviously there's a secularization in Western society. Those are also factors. But make no mistake, the homosexual and lesbian issue is a major factor. You don't have to become a priest or a nun to entertain that lifestyle or pursue that lifestyle anymore. And again, if you understand homosexuality and lesbianism, there is a proliferation of sadomasochism in that culture. Some of the flagellation rites and things like this from the Middle Ages that the Crusades brought back from copying the Shia Muslims into Europe, and they became practices in monasteries and convents and things, 
this whole sadomasochistic lifestyle under a religious umbrella of guys gets into the Catholic psyche. Quite a thing. Quite a thing. <clears throat> and it fits their false gospel. They don't believe in Catholicism that the blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. To profess the assurance of salvation is called the sin of presumption. You have to atone for your own sin in purgatory or have someone else buy mass cards or they would get into this self-mortification and self-beating and things like this. You've got to atone for your own sin. Well, this takes on a sexual dimension. Another is the church is the corporate bride of Christ. Never is Jesus pictured as a personal lover to a human woman. But in Catholicism, drawing on the pagan origins of nunneries, it did. Remember, Buddhist monks, and there were Buddhist monks, came as far west as Alexandria, where an early monasticism began with the Desert Fathers. Later on came the Benedictine version of it. But it was the same kind of perverse idea. The woman became the bride of God, and you'd have the surrogate in place of God. So Zeus, in Greek mythology, married a human woman. Uh, well, these nuns would call themselves brides of Christ. They referred to Jesus as their betrothed. They would take their vows as nuns, and it would be a wedding-type ritual. They would read, the, the Catholic mystics would read the Song of Solomon as erotic literature. They would have these religious rituals designed to induce sexual orgasms and things like this in the Middle Ages and nuns ecstatically, uh, but it was largely based on this mysticism and this perverse sexuality where Jesus was fantasized as a personal lover. This whole thing was completely sick, completely sick. It gets worse. Remember, Augustine had been a Mancian, and although he renounced elements of Mancianism, he brought elements of his Mancianism with him, the dualism. Everything spiritual was good, ethereal. Everything physical was bad. Now, the Greeks were like this. They had a view of God that he was impassable. I explained this before. A Greek would be perfectly good with the Logos in John chapter 1 until you got to verse 14. The Logos became socks. The Word became flesh. They couldn't handle that. This thinking gets in after, Plat after Augustine Platonizes the church and again sees it with Mankian influences. The only good thing about marriage is having children who will be celibate. To serve God, you had to be a priest or a nun or a monk. The rest were just breeding stock. That was their thinking. That was their thinking. <clears throat> that was the predominant thinking of Catholicism until the Reformation. That's how they looked at it. Well, let's go back and look at this further. Because Christ is the husband of the church, the bridegroom of the church, they see the priest as a surrogate Christ. Therefore, because Christ wasn't married, he was married to the church, the priest can't get married. Because he represents Christ. Yet, in the Eastern tradition of the Roman church, they let the priest get married. Why? Absurdity of absurdities. When the Crusades invaded the East and the schism happened between the East and Orthodox Church, following the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Latin Church following the Papacy, they said to the Eastern Orthodox Church, you can keep your wives and you can keep your Greek liturgy and Greek language instead of Latin, as long as you come under the Pope. It was all political. So you have Maronite Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and Byzantine rites of the Roman Church that are liturgically the same as the Eastern Orthodox, practically. But although they're not Latin, they come under the Pope and they are allowed to marry. Why is one allowed in here? 
It's completely ridiculous. It was all based on politics. And this Pope is doing it again. He's saying he's going to allow married men to become priests. Some can, some can't. Oh, my God. St. Paul writes in Timothy, forbidding marriage is a doctrine of demons. He made the male and female and said it was good, as I've said many times. Once you call something that God says is evil good, you're going to call something that is good evil. Just like with the homosexuals, the radical homosexuals. They calling something that God says is, is evil good so therefore, those who want to preserve same, uh, preserve uh, traditional marriage are called evil. Well, the converse is true. Once you call that which God says is good evil, you're going to call evil good. So the Roman church, he made the male and female and said it was good. That's evil. Because it's a physical act. It's not a desirable state spiritually. Therefore, something evil becomes good, child molestation becomes acceptable to them. Now it's true, the scripture does say that those with the grace to remain single to fulfill a certain ministry have a higher calling, but that's a grace for certain people. This whole thing is ridiculous and corrupt. This Pope, when he was the Archbishop of Argentina, behaved disgracefully. It's no wonder he said what he said about the homosexuality and two men in the same relationship. And it's no wonder he said what he's saying now and doing what he's doing now concerning the crackdown. There was a Catholic school in New Jersey, in Somerville, New Jersey, called Immaculata. I know it well. And a teacher on her private Facebook, not a nun, a secular teacher, on her private Facebook, made statements about preserving marriage. And she was fired for it. She was fired for it, and the bishop defended her being fired. This kind of corruption is unreal. Go read about it. This teacher fired from Immaculata High School in Somerville, New Jersey. Read the hypocrisy of the way the bishop of Matuchin behaved. It's corrupt from the top to the bottom, from the bottom to the top. The whole system is corrupt and morally depraved. This Pope is a natural progression following the unspeakable atrocities of his predecessors, particularly Joseph Ratzinger, that is Pope Benedict, and John Paul II, Carol Wojtyla. It is indeed an antichrist system. Don't listen to ecumenical evangelicals. They don't know what they're talking about. If you want to know about Roman Catholicism, talk to people saved out of it. Talk to ex-Roman Catholics who become born again. Go on the internet and Google the testimonies of priests and nuns who Jesus has saved out of that wicked religion. Now, having said that, liberal Protestantism is no better and in many respects worse. It is not the only false religion in the world. You have horrific sexual corruption of a homosexual nature happening in yeshivas among Orthodox Jews. You have horrific things of a sexual nature happen, happening among Anglo-Catholics, again, who, apart from the Pope, practice a form of Catholicism, Anglo-Catholicism. You have unspeakable sexual corruption in the cults, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons, always have had. Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, these people were sexually perverted. I'm not saying it is only Roman Catholicism. But it is not the Holy Mother of the Church. She's not holy, and she's not mother. She's the mother of whores. I have no question the Roman Catholic system will be a centerpiece of Babylon the Great in the Book of Revelation, as always has been. Drunk with the blood of the saints.
a confederation of the world's false religious system in some kind of league with the papacy is setting the stage for Antichrist. That is exactly what it is. This is a book called Hitler's Pope written by a Catholic historian. People should read it. It was the centrum of the Hans von Papen, Privy Chamberlain to, to the Pope that brought Hitler to power in Bavaria politically. They made a coalition with him. Read the history of the Roman Church. Read how John Paul II beatified Stepanak, the Nazi, who was complicit in the massacre of three quarters of a million Serbs, but they could have saved their neck if they converted to Roman Catholicism. This is during the Second World War, during the tenure of Pius XII. It is all unbelievable. It is ugly. It is the description that the book of Revelation gives to false religion at its worst. Drunk with the blood of the saints, the great whore. No, it's not only Rome, but Rome is the queen mother whore. It's the largest expression of false Christianity in history. And it will come into play centrally and focally in preparing the way and giving platform to Antichrist. I am not against Catholic people. I have a Catholic mother, a Catholic family, a Catholic friends. There are even Catholic priests who I'm friendly with. I pray for the salvation of those dear people. My argument is not against Catholics. My argument is against the Catholicism, the lie of Satan that's misleading them. My family, as most of you know, is a combination of Jewish and Irish. My mother's quite Irish. Roman Catholicism has never done anything for the Republic of Ireland except corrupt her government, exploit her people, and molest her children. That's Ireland. You'll find a similar ugly history throughout the Catholic world. I speak of Ireland because it's the one I'm most familiar with. But I go to Italy, I go to Poland, I know saved Christians in these places who come out of Catholicism. I know priests and nuns who've been saved. I know Bob Bush and Richard Bennett, and I know good people. Bridget O'Neill, they were saved out of convents and out of religious orders. They know what it is. I'm a friend of Sheldon Chartier, as he's speaking at a UK conference this year. He's from Canada. He was going to be a Roman Catholic bishop. He's half Jewish. And he was going to be a Roman Catholic bishop when he got saved. I'm appealing to our Catholic friends and viewers. It's not scriptural Christianity. It is institutionally corrupt, and it's not the way of salvation. You don't have to atone for your own sin in purgatory. His blood cleanses from all sin if you repent and ask him to forgive you. Scapulas can't save you, mass cards can't save you, no religion can save you, including the Church of Rome. Ex opere operato rituals, sacraments can't save you, papal decrees can't save you, only Jesus Christ can save you. You ask him to forgive your sins and to come into your heart, to fill you with his spirit and empower you to follow him on the basis of his word, you will have salvation as long as you trust and follow Jesus not an institution, be it Rome or otherwise. And this is not to say we don't need fellowship with other believers, but it must be fellowship and truth, meeting with others who believe the word of God. Not least of all, if you're a Roman Catholic parent, do not put your children at risk. Do not allow your children to go to Roman Catholic schools, even though it seems better than the state schools, homeschool, private school, but the pedophilia and sexual abuse of children that has gone on in Roman Catholic schools, you love your children. The Roman Catholic Church has proven repeatedly it will not protect the children, it will protect the molesters of children. It is not the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm either a liar or I'm telling you the God's honest truth. I appeal again to Roman Catholic people, 
even members of my own family, read the scriptures. Listen to what Jesus himself said. You don't need anybody but him because nobody can save you except him. Thank you for listening. My name is Jacob Pash. God bless. Dear friends, greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Frash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print, the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. First being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea. It's an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church, Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Glum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morio catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless. May Jesus be with you.